Hello. Today it's Mothering Sunday and on this day I like to celebrate women in the Bible and of course many of them are known for being mothers so we think of Mary the mother of Jesus um, and people like Sarah and Leah but uh, today I want to look at Deborah from chapter 4 and 5 of the book of Judges. Now Deborah is being described is described as a wife, the wife of Lapidoth, although we don't know anything about Lapidoth or who he was. But we don't know actually whether Deborah did have any children or not biologically, but the Bible still does describe her as a mother. And the key verse here is in chapter 5 verse 7, which says this: Villages in Israel would not fight until I, Deborah, arose until I arose a mother in Israel. So she's called a mother here, but she's not called a mother because she physically bears and nurtures biological children. She's called a mother because she leads the people, she nurtures them, she encourages them, inspires and challenges them. And under her leadership, the people of Israel win a great victory. Now, if you don't know anything about the book of Judges, I can't say it's my favourite book of the Bible, um, but it's from quite a grim period, really, in the history of the people of Israel. A lot of it's quite violent. And um, in the timeline of the Bible, the story is set in this kind of in-between time. So it's after Moses and Joshua. So the people of Israel have come into the promised land, um, but it's before the time of the kings. So the prophet Samuel hasn't yet anointed um, King Saul and then soon afterwards King David to lead the people. So we're in this kind of time in between those things and things are not going well. And one of the key verses in the book of Judges is from chapter 17 verse 6 and it's repeated again in chapter 21 verse 5, the very last verse of the book. So it must be significant and, and this verse says, in those days Israel had no king, everyone did as they saw fit, which can also be translated, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. I wonder, maybe that sounds familiar to us, thinking about the kind of society we live in today. Everyone doing what's right in our own eyes, without reference to God. You do you, if it feels good, do it. I'll follow my truth, you follow yours. Everyone doing what's right in their own eyes. Well, the other thing to say about the book of Judges is that there's a pattern that runs throughout it. And it ends up being a kind of cycle that's repeated time after time in the book. So what happens is, first of all, the people of Israel rebel in some way and turn away from God. Often they pursue idolatry or do some kind of evil in the sight of God. And so the second thing that happens is that God then gives them over into the hands of their enemies. So that's the surrounding people groups, people like the Philistines, the Midianites, the Amalekites and so on. So then they're kind of living under some kind of oppression for a time. And then after a while, they, they kind of come to their senses and repent and they cry out to God. They realise they need to turn back to him. So then the fourth thing that happens is God sends a rescuer, a leader or a judge emerges who takes some sort of action to help or rescue them. And then there is peace for a specified number of years until the whole thing repeats itself and Israel forgets and turns away from him again. Now, some of these judges will be names that you've probably heard of, people like Samson or Gideon, whereas others will be less familiar, like Othniel or Ehud. But Deborah is one of them, and she's the only female leader mentioned. But she's also presented in a thoroughly positive light and that's different to many of the other judges, people like uh, Gideon and Samson. Although they're used mightily by God, they're presented as very much flawed characters and they get it wrong. But uh, Deborah is not. She's presented very positively in the text. So we're going to have a look at the story now. Um, it's told twice as it happens. Um, in Judges chapter four, we have the story told as a straightforward narrative 
a story of what what happened. But then in chapter five, Deborah and her co-leader Barak sing a song together. And the song of Deborah is this amazing poem that basically tells the whole story over again, but in a very different form, like a poetic form. And it reflects on the events of what happened and turns it into a song of praise to God. So we're going to look a little bit at both of these and we're going to start by reading the first part of chapter four. Um, So I'm going to read Judges chapter four, verses one to 15. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord now that Ehud was dead. See the pattern starting here. So the Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. Sisera, the commander of his army, was based in Harisheth Hagoyim. Because he had 900 chariots fitted with iron and had cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years, they cried to the Lord for help. Now Deborah, a prophet, the wife of Lapidoth, was leading Israel at that time. She held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites went up to her to have their disputes decided. She sent for Barak, son of Abinoam, from Kadesh in Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go, take with you ten thousand men of Naphtali and Zebulun, and lead them up to Mount Tabor. I will lead Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his troops, to the river Kishon, and give him into your hands. Barak said to her, If you go with me, I will go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. Certainly I will go with you, said Deborah. But because of the course you are taking, the honour will not be yours, for the Lord will deliver Sisera into the hands of a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh. There Barak summoned Zebulun and Naphtali, and ten thousand men went up under his command. Deborah also went up with him. Now Heber the Kenite had left the other Kenites, the descendants of Hobab, Moses' brother-in-law, and pitched his tent by the great tree in Zananim near Kadesh. When they told Sisera that Barak, son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor, Sisera summoned from Harasheth Hagoyim to the river Kishon all his men and his 900 chariots fitted with iron. Then Deborah said to Barak, Go! This is the day the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. Has not the Lord gone ahead of you? So Barak went down Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. At Barak's advance, the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and army by the sword. And Sisera got down from his chariot and fled on foot. So I'll leave it there for now. Um, But If you don't know the rest of the story, it actually then focuses in on Sisera, the commander of King Jabin's army, and what happens to him. And we left him running away on foot, and he goes to the tent of a woman named Jael. Now, Jael is not an Israelite. She's from another tribe, the Kenites. And we're not told her motivation at all, but basically what she does, she lures Sisera into her tent, and he thinks she's going to shelter him. So he is safe from Barak because Barak's on his way there to kill him. But instead, while Sisera is asleep in Jael's tent, she, uh, rather grisly this bit, so just a warning there, um, she takes a tent peg and she drives it with a hammer through his skull and kills him. So you see that Deborah's prophecy there from verse 9 comes true. God has delivered Sisera into the hands of a woman that would have been seen as rather a shameful way to die. So that's the end of the story and uh, you can read it at your leisure but uh, I also really want us to read some of the song of Deborah in chapter 5 because it gives us more of a sense of what this strange story might actually mean and might mean to us particularly today. So I'm just going to read now um, part of the song of Deborah so this is Judges 5 and I'm going to read verses 1 to 20. On that day, Deborah and Barak, son of Abinoam, sang this song. When the princes in Israel take the lead, when the people willingly offer themselves, 
Praise the Lord. Hear this, you kings. Listen, you rulers. I, even I, will sing to the Lord. I will praise the Lord, the God of Israel, in song. When you, Lord, went out from Seir, when you marched from the land of Edom, the earth shook, the heavens poured, the clouds poured down water, the mountains quaked before the Lord, the one of Sinai, before the Lord, the God of Israel. In the days of Shamgar, son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were abandoned, travellers took to winding paths. Villagers in Israel would not fight, they held back, until I, Deborah, arose, until I arose a mother in Israel. God chose new leaders when war came to the city gates, but not a shield or spear was seen among 40,000 in Israel. My heart is with Israel's princes, with the willing volunteers among the people. Praise the Lord. You who ride on white donkeys sitting on your saddle blankets, and you who walk along the road, Consider the voice of the singers at the watering places. They recite the victories of the Lord, the victories of his villagers in Israel. Then the people of the Lord went down to the city gates. Wake up, wake up, Deborah. Wake up, wake up, break out in song. Arise, Barak. Take captive your captive, son of Abinoam. The remnant of the nobles came down. The people of the Lord came down to me against the mighty. Some came from Ephraim, whose roots were in Amalek. Benjamin was with the people who followed you. From Machir, captains came down. From Zebulun, those who bear a commander's staff. The princes of Issachar were with Deborah. Yes, Issachar was with Barak, sent under his command into the valley. In the districts of Reuben, there was much searching of heart. Why did you stay among the sheepfolds to hear the whistling for the flocks? In the districts of Reuben, there was much searching of heart. Gilead stayed beyond the Jordan. And Dan, why did he linger by the ships? Asher remained on the coast and stayed in his coves. The people of Zebulun risked their very lives. So did Naphtali on the terraced fields. Kings came. They fought. At Tanakh, by the waters of Megiddo, they took no plunder of silver. From the heavens the stars fought. From their courses they fought against Sisera. The river Kishon swept them away, the age-old river, the river Kishon. March on, my soul, be strong. I've stopped at verse 21 there. What on earth is this strange story saying to us today? Well, there's a few themes that I just want to bring out a little. First of all, the story of Deborah suggests to us that we can have complete confidence in God. Complete confidence in God. The enemies who were oppressing the northern tribes of Israel here were clearly very powerful and very intimidating. In chapter 4 verse 3 we're told that Sisera has 900 chariots fitted with iron. These chariots are mentioned again and again. The Israelites are described as only having swords and we're actually at the beginning of the iron age here in terms of history moving from the Bronze Age into the Iron Age. So we're talking here about a new military technology, a new weapon. It's like the invention of gunpowder or tanks or fighter jets or nuclear warheads. Here is a new technology, these iron chariots that's come along, and it's terrifying. Think how frightening it would have been for your little army with just their horses and their swords to come against these ironclad chariots filling the plain before you. But Deborah doesn't see them as frightening or intimidating. She's absolutely confident in God's ability to bring them victory, despite this opposition who are apparently invincible. And in chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, she tells Barak, go, take your men and do what I tell you, says God, and God will give you the victory. Now, Deborah is a prophet. She's someone with special gifts, a calling for discerning the voice of God. And she is completely confident that when God promises something, he's going to do it. But Barak, we see, is hesitant. He's hesitant. 
Now, he's in good company in this. If you think about people like Moses, Gideon, Jeremiah, all of them, when they're called by God, well, they hesitate as well. So he's not the only one by any means. But what he says is he says to Deborah, he's the military leader. And he says to Deborah, well, if you go with me, I'll go. But if you don't go, I'm not going to go. And so what we see here is that Barak's got trust and confidence in Deborah. But he doesn't yet have full trust and confidence in God. It's like he needs someone to hold his hand. And the narrative seems to be criticising him for this. So, so basically, that's what this prophecy is all about. He doesn't end up defeating Sisera by himself. It ends up being Jael and her tent peg who finally do away with him. So Barak doesn't get the glory for defeating the powerful enemy in the end. It's a foreign woman, a foreign woman. She's not even an Israelite, Jael. She's the one that finally defeats Sisera. So what this says to me is, where is our trust and confidence? Where is our trust and confidence truly? And it warns us that we can't just rely on our leaders. Now, it's good to have Christian leaders who can inspire us, who can encourage us, who can affirm our calling. And God is gracious to us and he knows that we do need people to walk alongside us, especially when our faith is weak. But at the end of the day, our faith has to be our own. And our trust should not be in those leaders, but in God. In verse 14, we see that it's God who goes ahead of Barak. It's God who goes ahead. And it's God who gives Barak the victory. And what about the chariots, the chariots that had seemed so intimidating? Well, it's hard to figure out what actually happened in the battle. But those references in in the song to um, the a storm and the rushing river, the river Kishon, there's a suggestion that perhaps um, the river Kishon flooded so that the chariots sunk down in the mud and became useless. So Sisera, the commander of this huge army, he trusted in his weapons and he trusted in his chariots, but they ended up being his downfall. And it's actually mentioned twice that he fled on foot. When the Old Testament repeats things, it pays to pay attention to that. And he fled on foot. So he's not in his iron chariots anymore. He's had to get down and just run away on his own two feet. So the iron clad chariots that seemed so intimidating were no match for the power of God. Where is our trust? Do we trust in human beings? Do we trust in our own strength? Do we trust in the things we have, our money, our skills? Or is our confidence in God? The theme I have to say that struck me most of all running through Deborah's story and especially through the early part of that song of Deborah was the theme of willingness. Willingness. Am I willing, are you willing to heed the call to respond to God, to stand up and be counted? So the song begins like this in chapter 5 verse 2. When the princes in Israel take the lead, when the people willingly offer themselves praise the Lord. And then again in verse 9, my heart is with Israel's princes, with the willing volunteers among the people. Praise the Lord. People with willing hearts who are willing to give themselves to respond to God's call. And this is a cause of praise and rejoicing in the song of Deborah. Later on in the song, we hear about the different tribes of Israel and how different ones of them responded to the call to battle. So some of them are praised for joining in. The people of the tribes of Ephraim, Benjamin, Zebulun and Issachar are all praised for joining in. So verse 15 it says, The princes of Issachar were with Deborah. Yes, Issachar was with Barak, sent under his command into the valley. But then there are others who do not come. So it talks about Reuben, doesn't it? In the district of Reuben, there was much searching of heart. Looking again at verse 15 and 16. In the district of Reuben, there was much searching of heart. Why did you stay among the sheepfolds? 
to hear the whistling of the flocks. The people of Reuben haven't come. They weren't willing. And then it says Gilead stayed beyond the Jordan. And Dan, why did he linger among the ships? So the people of Dan haven't come. They weren't willing. Asher, what about him? The tribe of Asher remained on the coast and stayed in his coves. So the people of Asher haven't come as they weren't willing. But then verse 18, it says, the people of Zebulun risked their very lives. So did Naphtali on the terraced fields. We're living in really difficult times at the moment. These are difficult times for the Christian church, particularly here in Wales, and difficult times in our world. And it's certainly a time when, as I said earlier, everyone does what is right in their own eyes. And in these times, just as in those ancient times of the judges, I believe that God is looking for willingness. God loves a willing heart, a heart that is devoted to him, a heart that is open to his call. And he's looking for people who are willing, people who are willing to stand up and be counted, people who are willing to step out in faith to respond to his call. And I think a lot of the time we just got too comfortable. We're too busy lingering by the ships or whistling for the flocks. And we can just hide away and have a quiet life. But actually God is calling us to battle, not a physical battle, It's a battle with the powers of evil that would seek to steal, kill and destroy. It's a battle for the witness in this land. So have a think. Am I being willing? Am I being willing? And it's Deborah herself in the story who gives us the example of what it means to stand up and be counted, to be open and listening for what God is saying, to respond to God's voice. And Deborah shows how one individual can have a massive influence. Going back to verse seven of the song, villagers in Israel would not fight. They held back until I, Deborah, arose, until I arose a mother in Israel. Deborah is able to turn unwilling and hesitant villagers into willing volunteers. So I want to challenge each of us listening to this to be a Deborah. She was a mother in Israel, not in the sense of having lots of biological children, but in the sense of her influence. I wonder what is your sphere of influence? Who are the people in your life that you have influence over? They might be your children or grandchildren or other members of your family, or you might have some kind of leadership role at work or in the community or within the church or whatever it is, might be very small, might just be an influence amongst some of your friends, but I believe all of us have some kind of sphere of influence. I wonder what if each person was to fully respond to God's call on our lives like Deborah, was to arise. Deborah's wise words, her discernment of the voice of God, her inspiring leadership, her courage, her complete trust in God, All these things had a transformative effect on the people of Israel. And they went from unwilling villagers who held back and would not fight to become an army that defeated the ironclad chariots of Sisera. Amazing things can happen when people truly step into the calling and authority that God has given them. I love verse 12. I think it should be like my alarm clock in the morning. Wake up, wake up, Deborah, wake up, wake up, break out in song. Arise, Barak, take captive your captives, son of Abinoam. I believe that God is calling you and me to wake up, to rise up. He's calling you and me for such a time as this, a time when everyone does what's right in their own eyes. And he's calling us to our true vocation as the people of God. Doesn't necessarily mean lots of doing lots of rushing around being busy but he's calling us to have an influence where we are in our sphere of influence to be mothers and fathers 
So three things for us to take away today. Number one, we can have complete confidence in God. Our trust should be in him, not in other people, not even in our leaders, not in our own strength and skills, but in God, in God. Number two, God is looking for people with willing hearts, people who are willing to stand up and be counted, to step out in faith for him in response to his call. And number three, God is calling us to be mothers and fathers in the place where he has planted us. And our lives can have an influence. They can have an influence on those around us. They can have a transformative effect through our words, through our prayers and through our example. And you know, when the people of God truly step into their vocation and respond to the call of God, it's a beautiful thing. And it's a reason to praise and rejoice in God. Let's pray. Lord, we're sorry that sometimes our confidence is not in you. Too often our confidence is in our own strength, the strength of what we have, or in other people, and not in you. Lord, we know we can completely trust and have confidence in you. And we know that in you, our weaknesses are washed away, that your power is made perfect in our weakness. And Lord God, we pray that you would give us willing hearts Hearts that are ready to respond to your call. Hearts that are ready to join in. And I pray, Lord, that you will help us in these difficult times, these times when everyone does what is right in their own eyes, to stand up and be counted, to step into our full authority and calling in you. I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.